1951, the Peak District became the first of 15 unique locations in Britain to be designated as a national park. These areas were to be safeguarded for their rich history, wildlife and landscape. The Peak District is undoubtedly the most rich and complex of them all. Its northern edges are the high, rugged moorlands of the southern Pennines. To the south are the picturesque wooded valleys of the Staffordshire moorlands, and at its heart, the spectacular gorges and meadows of the Derbyshire Dales. My name is Byron Machen, and I've spent the entirety of my life exploring the Peak District National Park. Over the years, I've uncovered many of its secrets, and in this documentary, I'm going to be revealing to you its natural history. We shall follow the cycle of the seasons as we explore the intricate relationship between landscape and wildlife, looking at the different ways in which the plants and animals have adapted themselves to survive in this, England's most sublime national park. On the northeast extremity of the Peak District, just before the high ground gives way to the sprawling city of Sheffield, are the Haversage Moors. They are home to a large number of archaeological features, but one stands out above all others. Standing on an imposing promontory 750 foot long by 250 foot wide, and with cliffs up to 30 foot high on three sides, this is Carl Walk. The massive cliffs provided an impenetrable natural defence in this desolate location. The only side of the promontory without the natural cliffs is the western side, where Carl Walk slopes down to meet Higator. Here, defences have been put in place. This massive wall of grit, stone and earth has been built up to 10 foot high in places, offering a formidable defence. We've returned to the Lathkill Valley under the cover of darkness and now we're going to be exploring the major workings of Mandale Suth and Mandale Mine. Now as I've already said, in the winter Mandale Suth is usually a torrent of fast flowing water but now all that's going to be down there is the mud and the mosquitoes. Let's go in. This is where they've got waste rock, and to save time and effort of carting it outside, they will pack it in the rift where they've already excavated the lead ore from. You can see here that you've got large stone stemples supporting behind which is much smaller packed material. If it's not packed incredibly securely, then sometimes this can collapse and cause fill-ins in some of the levels. But here, even though it looks like some of the stones are very precarious. It survived for hundreds of years. When coal was king, there were thousands of miners in North Staffordshire. The pits were big employers. The area's mining heritage dates back centuries. Fascinated by that history, amateur filmmaker Byron Machin from Leek decided to make a documentary tracing the story of mining in the Peak District. At Ecton, the whole hillside is totally riddled with mining. If you were to go down there and in some of the underground caverns, if you shone a light from one side, it would not hit the other side. The loads were so immense. And the actual catacombs of the collieries that are actually found upon places like Danebower Moss and Goldstitch Moss, they run for miles. The film includes underground footage. The film's been released on DVD and is on sale in the Peak District. It's a record of Staffordshire's rich industrial heritage. Liz Copper, BBC Midlands Today, in the Staffordshire Moorlands. 
submarine volcanic vents also formed in the lagoon. They laid down large deposits of ash and a fluid basalt. The fluid basalt forms hard layers of rock, the ash forms layers of tuff, also known to the local miners as toadstone. Often it can have a greenish complexion, but here this two centimetre band in a works of quarry is quite grey. But it is always very, very crumbly. Within the lagoon, limestone is formed by the process of lithification. Here, as layers of sediment are placed on the bottom of the lagoon floor, small amounts of seawater become trapped between the pores. Under successive layers and heavier pressures, this water becomes chemically active and starts to move around. The calcite in the rocks is susceptible to this fluid that can be acid or alkaline and is eventually laid down as a kind of cement between the pores of the sediments that actually hold the solid rock together. The Staffordshire Moorlands are a very special place. Designated as a site of special scientific interest, they are considered to be of importance both on a national and European scale for their wide range of habitats. Unfortunately, one of those habitats is currently under threat, and that's what I'm here to tell you about today. Gib Tor is its name, a hundred acre conifer plantation planted in the mid-1970s as a cash crop. But as the market fell, so did the price of this wonderful forest, and unfortunately it was left without management. However, that wasn't necessarily a bad thing, as now it has evolved into a much wider and richer habitat than the rough grassland that was here before. Inside the forest, the warm, moist and sheltered rides now provide a wide range of habitats for mosses, lichens and fungi to thrive. Miller, could you please tell us what your talk's going to be on today? It's going to be on really what this hall's about. It's about the power of rulership going back to 32,000 BC and the methods that he used which have been lost and in fact symbology around this hall here is called the King's Hall which stands for ruler or measurer uh, um, that's what a, a king is and it's even um, manifest outside with the cross that you have on the wall okay so what I'm going to talk about is techniques of measuring nature that the ancients used um, up to about 4,000 years ago and how it's in the pyramids so uh, when you're talking about 4,000 years ago, so during the Bronze Age, what signs were there in this country? Was there any? Yes, there was. Um, 1300 BC, we, we have in this country and in Norway and Scandinavia signs of crosses and ships and the methods of navigation. So you're talking about things like how Kalanish is built in a cross shape or is it? Yes, I am. Absolutely. And that's there too. Absolutely. And um, also that they left the symbology of the power of the sun, how it creates the seasons and how it affects life and death. And so is that sort of like how during the Neolithic and Bronze Age you had a lot of circular objects like stone circles, hinges? Yes, that's, that's absolutely right. Yeah, and, and it's all about what the ancients would call the knowledge of wheels, the wheels of the stars, the wheels of the seasons. But the issue is that we've not known until 1997 how to actually measure them, how they actually measured the angles and made the zodiacs and told the time and then created a system of measurement to avoid chaos, if you like, by creating order or a balance out of order and it became a philosophy, if you like. These show how strong the Christian religion still is in this landscape. But there's a religion dating back many millennia before Christ, one that I want to look further into, and one whose monuments still survive across the hills, just as the churches do today. But there are features even more impressive than the Cheshire Plain. Roaches. 
These amazing gritstone outcrops would have jutted out just above the ice during the last events in glaciation, and there they would have been subject to intense weathering and frost shattering, which has made them into the many amazing shapes that we see around here today. The effect of isostatic readjustment was also felt in Britain. Isostatic readjustment is another knock-on effect after a glaciation. During the last glaciation, the ice core was centred on Scotland and so immense pressure was placed on this and the actual ground was compressed and pushed down into the mantle. This caused southern England to rise and after the glaciation, when all the ice went in actually a very short period of what we think is 50 years, it would have rebounded up and so southern England would then have sunk back to its previous location and as this is still continuing to the day at a rate of one centimetre a year, it continues to sink and Scotland continues to rise. Now, a favourite hobby for most teenagers is making your bedroom as untidy as possible. But one 14-year-old from Staffordshire spends his spare time more creatively. His name's Byron and he's a writer. It's true. He lives on the edge of the Peak District in Staffordshire and he's written a guidebook for visitors to the area. It's now being sold in the local tourist information office. Come rain or shine, Byron Machin loves walking in the Staffordshire Moorlands. It's his love of the countryside, near his home in Leek, which inspired him to write the guidebook. I love the Peak District and the area, so I thought it'd be nice to make a guidebook and pass on all my knowledge to the other people of the area who visit in the book. Like, even today, even though it's wet and groggy, I, could, I still enjoy coming to get away in the quietness and the solitude. Byron's book contains suggested routes for cycling and driving, also details of interesting villages to visit. We are in Flash, the highest village in Britain. This is one of the places that I wrote an article about in my book. You can see for miles here on a beautiful clear day, but today, as we are high in the clouds, you can hardly see a foot in front of you. Byron did all the research for the book during his holidays, and he published it himself. At Leek's Tourist Information Office, they've already nearly sold out of copies, and it looks like the book will go into a second print run. We were just very impressed with his initiative for such a young lad. Um, to put together a book like that, we were just very impressed. It was, gave a lot of local knowledge and background, and it was something we were just very impressed with. Oh, good old Byron. It's a beautiful part of the world. Mm, it is. Wonderful. Now, another beautiful part of the world...